gonna start with Priscilla and I'm just gonna ask each of them to share with us um, how, how you got started in art and you know why you love the figure. So I've been painting for 45 years to the math. <laughs> so uh, I sold my first piece when I was 14 and literally was you know hooked in art ever since then. As an artist, uh, mainly painting, um, I've tried every subject matter. My personality is that I need to be challenged every time. And as I progressed and I went from florals to good lives, uh, the one subject matter that every single time that I paint, even after 30 plus years of painting it, that is always a challenge is the uh, figure. This is one of my pieces here. And no many, how many things I do, um, I'm always, like I said, it's a challenge. The reason I love the figure is because it can convey emotion and a story. I, as an artist, as an art collector, I'm drawn to paintings that uh, evoke an emotion or tell a story. And therefore, that's what I love to paint. And we'll get more of that story later, but uh, that's a great introduction. So, uh, Levi, tell us how you got into art. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Levi Selway. I was born and raised in Sussex, England. Uh, my mother is from Thailand, my father's English. And my mother loved art. She trained as a nurse, but as she raised uh, our family, I'm one of seven children, uh, she always found time for art. And uh, she passed away when I was quite young, but she in my early years, she transferred that love for art to me, and I carried that uh, throughout uh, the rest of my life. And I kind of um, veered away from art, as many people do, uh, thinking about careers and whether a career as an artist is a viable uh, profession. And uh, I ended up actually at medical school in 2010. Um, a far cry from the art studio and I had um, basically I, I, I came to accept and embrace that that was even though uh, I loved working with people uh, uh, that really that wasn't uh, the path that I wanted to follow and I, and I left medical school and got straight back into my art and it was actually my wife who purchased uh, some clay and tools for me uh, when, uh, in 2011. And she told me that there was a, a public, an open studio at one of the foundry where, where we cast the bronze. And it wasn't too far from my home. So I went there. And when I went, walked into that artist's studio and I saw all of these clay figures you know, large and small, all over the, uh, you know, feel of this studio. Uh, I had one of those sort of coming home experiences and it was this, uh, I just knew that that, what, that is what was missing, that was the missing element. And uh, for the past nine years, I've kind of been pursuing uh, the figure I attended the Florence Academy in Italy uh, as part of that pursuit to uh, really hone in on some training and uh, I, I, I fell in love with uh, the Renaissance masters. Uh, we spent time in Paris where my wife's from. We traveled uh, to Vienna and all of that, all of that uh, collection of art that is housed within uh, the museums and these European cities just lit a fire in me that uh, is burning bright today and uh, the figure there's something extremely ancestral about the figure and even when uh, you think about these cave paintings that they discovered in Borneo in Indonesia last year dating back to 
37,000 years ago. As a race, we've been uh, fascinated with representing ourselves, uh, the only species that can do that. And, uh, and I think there's just a very ancestral element in that. Uh, the figure presents uh, an endless array of possibilities and the complexity of the figure in its anatomy is something that is a lifelong pursuit. Wow, I want to go to all those places you've been. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what, we're going to delve more into uh, everything that you said, but let's go ahead and hear from Aiden how he got started in art. Hi, my name is Aiden Kringen. I'm from Sonoma County, California. And I've been an artist all my life. Um, it was the one thing I had growing up that I focused the most on. And when it came time to decide what I wanted to do with my life, hold that microphone. Now. When it came time to decide what I wanted to do with my life, I had to just, I had to either pursue an art career or a career in graphic design or something of that sort. Uh, I met my wife Carla, and she encouraged me to pursue a fine art career. And I delved into that right away uh, at the age of nineteen, and. Started showing in galleries, posting my own shows, and um, I've always been interested in portraying the figure and seeking beauty through the figure. I think when I was younger, it was much more abstracted. Um, and as I'm getting older, I'm more interested in portraying realism and using chaotic, fragmented forms to seek beauty in the figure. But it's an ongoing pursuit, and it changes every year. Yeah, that's I'm going to come down here by you and yeah. make sure we can get this painting on so everybody can see it. And um, I love what you just said. I'm going to stay with you to go deeper dive. Um, you do a beautiful job with the entire figure, the skin tones. I mean, when we get applications, they're all, you know, it's always fun and exciting. Every once in a while, I get one that takes my breath away. And, and these two new applicants were great. but. The fragment you talked about is right. very interesting too. So I'll hold this up so people can see it a little bit better here and on, on camera and we talk. Right. With that microphone close. So when I started really studying the figure when I was younger, I started noticing that there were planes that define the, the form in certain areas of light and shadow. And I started to trace those planes as a way to kind of organize the figure for myself. And that's when I developed that style of fragmentation and kind of fractured um, aesthetic. And that was where it really developed. And then I've been trying to push that ever since. And it's constantly trying to find that balance between that pure abstraction and, and realism. But that is uh, basically what I'm, what I'm working on and trying to do in my work. Somebody asked you that they repeat this question. Somebody asked you the other day about do you paint the lines first and then the person? Oh, actually, you might want to repeat that. Yeah, so I work on forming the figure first and putting down some basic layering. And then I'll start to use the lines to dissect certain areas of the body and bring light into certain areas and then cross over those areas and it forms a grid in my mind that I can kind of follow. And and then from there it's back and forth between layer of color and layer of line work in that fragmentation. And it's until the very end when I when I feel like the light hits certain areas just right and it guides your eyes around the canvas and around around the piece. And, and so that it, it forms a whole. And it, you know, yeah, I love that. The fragmented realism is awesome. And just your your skin tones are magnificent, the hair and everything. But do, do you have um, a favorite artist who like, has influenced your work? Oh. oh, let's see. On the spot, it's hard to think of one I mean, I amongst think, so many. Yeah. But 
on Ray, John yeah, Senior Sergeant, and then Yeah, Sergeant is definitely a big one. Like the magentas and the turquoise and the and the bright right. white. So but the continuity of your your brush strokes is always there. Thank you. Yeah, I'm interested in I have a lot of ideas for palettes and, and I'd like to work on both extremes. Some of the more subtle tones and then moving to really bright tones and they those palettes can influence each other in different ways in my mind. And that's what kind of keeps it fresh and exciting in the studio for myself. Yeah. And you have yeah. a favorite model, I think you said too. Yeah, I've been lucky enough to work with uh, a lot of friends of mine, as well as professional models that capture certain expressions I'm looking to portray. Um, this happens to be my friend Alex, and I think she did a wonderful job for being a first time model for an artist like me. And um, I, it's been a pleasure to work with her and portray her and a few other pieces as well, and which some of which are hanging right now in, in my booth. Yeah. And modeling is very difficult to do. I, I, I was recruited at a time or two when my stepmom was the director at Scottsdale Artist School and they'd have models not show up or not be able to make it. And you, I mean, you get to rest, but it's, it's a lot of work. So kudos to those good models. I know you'll talk about some beers too. So, okay, I bet, I'm bet i sure we're going to have more questions coming back around you in a little bit, um, Aiden. But Levi, I do work out, but I'm not going to lift your sculpture. Um, but we will want to get a closer look at that for sure. Um, but you have some really magnificent pieces. You do a lot of um, athletic pieces. You do singers. What is the source of your inspiration? And then I also want to delve into your anatomy knowledge. Yeah, um, the broad strokes of my body of work are celebrating a life well lived. And uh, whether that be uh, a lady, uh, an expectant mother, uh, about to bring a life into the world, whether that be a child who is uh, given the freedom to dream, uh, or uh, individuals, icons, legends who have paid uh, an incredible price to to rise to the top of their game, to rise to the top of their uh, their industry or their or their disciplines, and so the the piece that I brought that hopefully we can get a look at uh, is a piece that is inspired by uh, the the darling of the nineteen seventy six Olympics uh, in Montreal, Canada. Uh, she was a 14 year old Romanian gymnast who burst onto the stage, uh, not only uh, garnishing three gold medals, but was the first gymnast to receive uh, perfect tens. And, and she captured uh, the imagination, not just of the sporting world, but uh, uh, the general public at large, she lit up the arena, and that is the title of the piece, uh, Lighting Up the Arena. Um, I believe that uh, all human beings uh, have uh, this latent potential, and if they were to grasp the vision of uh, that potential and latch on to a passion that lights a fire within them, that uh, they can uh, light up their own individual arenas. So, so my work is very much uh, inspired by, by individuals like Nadia um, and that, that's kind of uh, what inspired the light to fire in me. That's wonderful. I love that. And you're really capturing the emotion as well as you're just doing a magnificent job capturing the, the figure. And I think that's a, a true gift that you really you convey that emotion through it. You've got um, a new piece you're working on over there. 
Michael Jordan? That's right, yeah. I've uh, brought a couple of pieces that I'm working in the clay. Um, and Michael Jordan, uh, he was a childhood hero of mine, uh, who really was kind of the first global sports superstar, but uh, he captured the imagination uh, of kind of taking his sport to new heights, literally. Uh, and uh, it, in the 1988 slam dunk contest, he always defied gravity by by taking off from the from the uh, the, the the foul the foul shot line. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it, uh, and it's kind of just soaring through the air. And it's kind of this just iconic sporting image, but just captivates the 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 imagination of what what humans are capable of and just pushing those boundaries that's what that's what i love about sport um so i've got a, i've got a michael jordan and i've kind of raised him up so the this figure is standing about six foot three now so which is uh you know to convey that that uh, sense that that feeling of flight um, and I've, i'm working on a, a cassius clay a muhammad ali uh from one of these iconic sporting moments uh also just captivates this incredible raw emotion that athletes release when they're performing you know they spend so much time prep for you know training and when it comes time to perform uh, and they're on the top of their game there's so much raw emotion i try to infuse into the clay uh, and uh, convey yeah and, and michael jordan was art in motion for sure <laughs> Many of those. So, okay, um, Priscilla, your eyes kind of perk up. You also thought about going into medicine. Yeah, actually, I was pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, going to be a neurosurgeon, and my dad, Mr. New York executive, talked me out of medical school. And he was my number one supporter in the arts. I'm self taught, like Daniel. And um, I do it every single day. And uh, with my paintings, what I try to capture is, is that emotion. This painting here is called Unwind. Um, as I do photo shoots for models, sometimes I paint live models. I love the live model session, but one of a slow painter. And it takes, this one took about five months to do. I do layer after layer. And my goal is to capture that emotion. I mean, I do realism. Um, my goal is not photorealism, but I just keep working and adding layers until I capture, in this particular case, I was doing a photo shoot, and I'm taking a lot of photos, a lot of posing, and when I told her, okay, I'm done, she just went back. Uh, she was done. Um, and that's what I have a tendency to paint is when that unguarded moment in the model or the person that I'm around. With the title, you can see her hands are very relaxed. So I am telling you, the viewer, that you know her hands are very relaxed. It's a very relaxed pose. Um, her face is not asleep. You can actually, if you look closely, you can tell that she's still processing what she's been doing, what her day has been. And then you can actually see the tension in her neck. So she's still in the process of unwinding. So from the, you know, starting at the top and as the body goes down. And I think to I feel I capture that emotion and that feeling. Going back to what Aiden said and Susan said about palettes. I have a tendency to paint with a lot of color. Actually, I, love, I wear black all the time. Colors in the canvas. Um, but in this case, it was important that I convey that peacefulness, that unwinding moment. You know, red would have changed the energy in the painting. So as artists, while we're painting, I think, we're very much aware of what that color is going to dictate to the viewer and also the feeling that we're capturing in the painting. Do you, do you have, like, secret flesh tone color combinations that you know? Oh my gosh, no. I'm all over the map. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know some artists like, yeah, uh, really have precise, like Heidi Rosner, precise color. Right. And, and the reason I don't is because look at this room. 
whether you're blonde, brunette, doesn't matter. All our skin tone varies so much. And there's, you know, the blues, I mean, the blues, the greens, all that. So I really, I, I try not to have a formula just because I think then you end up, there's some artists that are absolutely fascinating. They're incredibly talented. And I look at their paintings and every single skin tone is the same. So I have too many different models that I try to be true to who they are. So I don't have a formula. And um, again, you paint other subject matter, but the figure is your primary thing that yeah. you're intrigued by that. And yeah, it's it's the most. I mean, it's always a challenge. I get bored easily. I'm going to be honest with you guys. So. Um, and so that's why I picked that. If you were to go to my studio, now in between my figure paintings, I do these eight by eights and they're little silly creatures that I, frogs and so on, and that's my mental break. Um, normally I only have like three or four at this show. This is the only time you'll see them is at this show. Having said that, if you were to go to my studio right now, you'll see a lot of them. I've been painting all year long, seven days a week, um, which has actually been really nice. Um, but yeah, so I, I, if I'm thinking of painting or starting anyone, it's always a figure. In water, I'm known for throwing my models in the water, I'm in the water with them. As a former swimmer, it's one of my favorite places to be. So this is sort of rare actually for me to have a non-water figure piece. And also just, she's sort of at rest where the other ones are more accurate. Right yeah, yeah, the other ones are trying not to drown because I keep them in the water for so long. So this is a different pose for me. Definitely. Very good. Very good. Well, um, I know that uh, I haven't seen you do many males. You know, I have one male left. I should do more because they do sell. Yeah. So, okay. so maybe, you know, the next, uh, yeah, believe it or not, what's really hard is to have one of the guys say, yes, I'll do it. I mean, female models are easy to find. Male models, they're like, do you want me to do what? And yeah, so, well, yeah. We, we have, have an interest in, we have a new challenge. Male models. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay. Good to know that. Good to know. Um, so, anatomy is very important. Um, like I like to go, one thing when you walk around the show, um, a lot of the artists have reference books and it's really fun to like flip through those. And um, I was walking by Todd Paxton the other day and grabbed one of his figure, figure books and then Levi has these Bibles of anatomy and I, I think it's a little bit interesting that there was an interest in medicine because again, it's about the human form. Um, and your your work is a little bit more impressionistic, Levi, than realism, but your anatomy is spot on. So how how do you study that, and how important is that? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I am heavily influenced by the impressionist, post-impressionist. I I fell in love with Van Van Gogh when uh, I was a teenager. Um, and so I do, you know, on the surface, you know, try to leave those certain um, finger marks or, you know, just like the brush strokes in, in Van Gogh's paintings uh, to try and describe the movement of, of the muscle and convey more emotion than, uh, you know, uh, smoothing that off. And, but, yeah, you're right. The anatomy is absolutely... Uh, central to to the construction of the sculpture and at the academy there is a heavy emphasis much in uh, the tradition of uh, that began with the, the renaissance masters and uh, da vinci's uh, study of cadavers and uh, to understand what are the underlying um, What's the underlying construction and what determines all of these forms that we see on the surface? So uh, this um, pursuit of understanding the form absolutely uh, hinges on not just, uh, well, a combination of both the anatomical study, but also of 
studying the figure, uh, the live figure, in order to to build up a, a library of form. Because every human being has a uh, different form. Uh, you know, we all have the same construction, but well, we all have different forms, and so uh, both those. Uh, elements are, are crucial in order to uh, render uh, a natural uh, form. So, um, so yeah, I construct uh, based on an anatomic understanding and this, this kind of the library of form garnished uh, over years of uh, uh, studying live models and then uh, but then I, I kind of let emotion take over, you know. So yes, there is the rigor and the technical side of construction, but once that is in place and I'm happy with, you know, the movement, uh, the good movements of the large, uh, you know, uh, parts of the body, then letting emotion take over on the surface and, uh, and, and yeah, showing those Showing the uh, like like Van Gogh's brushstrokes, showing those those uh, finger marks and thumbprints and tool marks to enhance uh, the the uh, the emotion of, of of the form uh, in the particular sculpture. What is the most challenging thing to get right for you? Is it like the face, the hands? I think the the hardest thing is really uh, uh, use of positive and negative space uh, for each sculpture, and um, and that's something I'm really trying to push in this particular sculpture. I'm not sure. If I, am I able to show anything on? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So on, on this particular sculpture, um, what's going on around the figure with, with these spheres is uh, an enhancement of of large movement. Levi, yeah. over on this side, if you can. So yeah, you can kind of that, that's kind of been enhanced with these spheres that I've kind of built with the composition of, uh, and also. You always get a very natural arch in the back. It's a beautiful part of the human figure. You kind of have this S-shaped curve in the spine. Uh, so in this particular uh, pose, which most human beings can't get into, uh, for, for, yeah, Thank you for un saying that. understandable reason. Um, but you see this arch, I've kind of uh, enhanced that with, with this arch. Uh, this kind of pyramidal uh, swoosh here. And what I've tried to do is just take that line and continue it down. It's echoing the nautilus shape that we find in fossils and in many plants. And so um, thinking beyond the figure, thinking beyond the, uh, the positive shape is something I'm really trying to explore in, in order to enhance the figure in, in its setting. That's lovely, thank you. And I'm sure that the composition of the, the sphere is also, is to draw our eye through the piece. And your patina is, is marvelous too. I know you've got some very different patinas that uh, are very important to you. I, I wanna come back to patinas in a minute, but um, the reason I asked that question about parks when uh, we were at Crystal Bridges Museum a few years ago in Bentonville, Arkansas, and they have an extraordinary collection of mostly American art. It's, it's all American artists, but there was a few that um, supposedly they were like, well, they came to America once, so they got some pieces in there, but um, the security guard came up to us and he said, do you know why so many of these early portraits, uh, their hands were behind their back or in their jacket or, and he said it's because it cost a lot more to hire a painter to paint hands because they're so difficult. So 
the the more wealthy people were, the more they would show hands. And I thought that was fascinating. And um, I loved the times, like uh, this past spring, I was in um, Asheville, North Carolina, and went to the Biltmore Estate. And during that time period, which was what the early 1900s, I, I can't, I can't, somebody help me. But anyway, um, those people of that time captured moments and honored their friends and family with portraits painted and um, in inside the mansion there, um, Mr. Vanderbilt had hired John Senior Sergeant to do, I mean, there's just portraits all throughout the place. And he had one done of his gardener, that's not the right word, but the, the man who planned all of the gardens at the Biltmore Estate, he had also helped design Central Park. If I had really been smart, I would have looked this up before we sat here, but um, we can Google it and find out. But he had his portrait done in the garden, and then his architect was also done. So it was really a, a beautiful way to honor people. Um, do, do either of you do, or any of you do commissions like that for people? Yes? I do, actually. My studio, I'm working on one for uh, someone from Canada. Uh, commission this piece, but going back to what you said, you hear the expression, it'll cost you an arm and a leg. It comes from painting. Yeah, that's, that's it. It'll that, cost you an arm and a leg. It would cost you a lot more to. Um, so, with my hands, actually, when I was self taught, and the first hand that I ever did looked like silly putty with those mini sausages that you get in a can. I kid you not. And so, I spent a whole year just doing that. Um, and I love doing hands, and they're not difficult for me, but as an artist, I will tell you, the point from the nose to the bottom of the lip is my Achilles heel. <laughs> I will spend hours working that one out. But yeah, so I, you know, definitely do commissions. Um, and what I love is that the commissions that I get are not necessarily standard portraits. It is usually an unusual moment caught by the person who took the photograph. And so that's the commission that I'm doing right now. It's, it's, there, it's not your typical portraits that I get commissioned. So, Aiden, how about you? I have done some commissions, and they've been interesting to do because they teach you what someone is really seeing when they look at your work and what they want to see in a piece if they commission you to do one. And they want a likeness, but they also want the essence of the person that they, they are planning to have in the painting. And that, has made me think more about, ever since starting commissions, it's made me think more about the other work that I've done, because that's what we're shooting for, is the essence of a person and that true beauty of that person. And the likeness can be here and there, and uh, you can get away with certain with certain things, but it's the essence that is really important. I think that's the, just the perfect description of it, because that's really, again, those, those soaring, memorable pieces that the, of art that I love to look at. It's exactly that they caught that essence. And that, that takes a certain combination of the technical skill and then the art skill. How do you, how do you, um, how do you feel like you get that emotion and essence? Is it through gesture or is it? I think it's, it's a combination of things. It, it may be hard to put exactly into words, but I don't, it's not necessarily spending time with the person or anything like that because often I don't meet the person that I'm painting, but there is some, you have to kind of study it with your heart in a way, if, you, if that makes sense. Um, and you have to really feel that out as you're developing a portrait or working on either a commission or portraying a friend or, uh, or a model. And, that might be hard to train somebody to do, but I would say to start with your heart and go from there. Very well said, very well said. And we are, we are actually going to have our discovery devoted to the idea of commissions, like how to custom com order um, commissions. So we'll, we'll delve a lot into that in the future. Just that idea of capturing that emotion in the moment in time. Did I, were you gonna say something else? Okay, come on. I was just going to add that um, on the topic 
uh, one of my pieces that I have is the, it's a small piece, but a very intimate piece that uh, is of my own daughter, actually. Um, and yeah, it, it was a very uh, special journey to sculpt uh, someone who's very close to me. Um, and it was, a, it's, it was the first piece that I sculpted, actually. Uh, and I started to sculpt my daughter uh, when we were living in Nice, France, and she she was only, I think, about nine years old at the time. And I never finished the piece. It kind of uh, it came with us, and we 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 were actually uh, the day we were moving back to England. Uh, we just had so much in the car, and uh, I, I thought I just I just leave it. You know, it's I, I, I'll work on I'll do it again and work on something else. And my wife was adamant. She said, "No, <laughs> I'm going to put it on my lap." And we drove all the way up from the bottom of France all the way to England. She had a little daughter, a mini, mini daughter, on her lap um, because she, you know, I think it was her way of saying, "No, I believe, I believe in you. You, you can do this." You know, and. Uh, Three years it sat on our windowsill in England uh, watching the rain fall. Uh, <laughs> and then when we came to back to the US about 18 months ago, uh, that, and, and, I, and I transitioned to full time art, that was the first piece I was going to uh, bronze. And uh, so I actually updated it because she had grown five years. Uh, so. It kind of grew with them, and so uh, that was the first piece I bronzed, and it and it's here at celebration. <laughs> oh, that's a great story. I have to go look at that now. Little mini child. Um, how cool would it be to have your father capture you on canvas or or clay? Um, I like to always make sure if there's questions from either our wonderful guests who are with us today here or anybody online, uh, feel free to let us know but um i guess one of the things i always think about um with, with figurative again is just you're honoring such a uh, like you said the ancestral or the the gift of humanity and the fact that yes from the very beginning of time there were stick crimes um and i never really thought about it before that we're the only species that can create art of ourselves <laughs> that's very interesting but um, I think everybody needs some great figurative work in their collection because it can really balance. And I love how you can combine, you know, the abstraction so it can fit in with any different kind of collection and um, really enhance your home. Do you have a question, anybody? No question. Oh, wow. Okay. So, I'm sorry? They're in awe. I love it. Yeah, I mean, these guys are the best. It's just, and we have more. It was hard to choose this panel because I'm like, ooh, there's so many people here that could be great. Um, but we're going to be populating different panels, um, like Judy Dickinson, who, who's in the room here, um, amazing figurative painter, Todd Paxton, figurative sculptor. I mean, there's the talent here just is makes all of us be in awe. And I'm very grateful to have recruited the two newbies right off the bat and I think you're doing a fantastic job and um Priscilla's always got you know words of wisdom and I love that and you know what I like about each one of you is I know how supportive your 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 spouse is like you both have mentioned your wives and how important they've been in your career and um you know you have the best it's, it's a daunting career to be an artist and um, we're lucky to have the support system that we do uh, you know and because otherwise, it's, it's difficult enough. But you know, we're passionate about it. I mean, I, I cannot imagine not doing this every day. And you know, my dad way back when knew me better than I did, you know, myself. And I have never looked back. I still like science. I'm still a nerd, but I now just paint with colors. <laughs> Use the science of art. Well, and it, Seth Fairweather, one of our glass and mixed media guys, he was on that track. So there's some kind of correlation there, but um, 
lot of, it's a lot of brain power. But I think that your point that being an artist can be daunting, I mean, it, it's a full-time devotion. And um, there's a, the, I shared at the beginning of the show, the kind of the, a quote on commitment and all things change when you commit to your work and to have somebody who's right there behind you saying, go for it, is, is critically important. So kudos to the, the other halves. Um, but it, have you ever, is there ever, have you ever had a painting or a sculpture that you've sold that you wish you could have back? Yes. And there, there's, there's always that painting that when you finish, you go, wow, even to yourself, that you've been striving to do for so long that that was the, the ultimate hope that you would achieve. And there's one piece that is in Canada. And I thought, great, I've achieved it from now on, I'll be able to reproduce this. <laughs> and guess what, it doesn't work that way. I mean, I, you know, it's good. I mean, you know, it's like I said, we are forever growing and learning. And but yeah, there's one piece that if I, looking back, I would not maybe have sold it. So there's another piece that I did that is very emotionally important to me, it says my daughter. And it is the one painting that I truly captured who she is. I had truly captured her essence and it's a large painting and that one's not for sale. So. <laughs> Ms. Deanna, a question? Yeah. I'm glad that you do what you do because those of us that collect can't. Right. So we are pleased that you do what you do. I have one piece in my collection that um, a gentleman painted that I bought at his show and he had said, if it doesn't sell, he wouldn't sell it again because it's of his granddaughter. And it hangs in my house. So, yay! yay. Yes. Yes. It's nice when you got one of those super special ones. I mean, they're all special, but there's, yeah. there's a few that, yeah. So, um, what about you, Aiden? Yeah, certain pieces do mark milestones, I think, in a, in a career, but it's probably better that I don't have them because I judge them pretty harshly. I like most artists uh, that I've talked to, and uh, I, I can always remember those pieces for sure. And I'm thankful that people appreciate them and hang them in their homes. Um, but yeah, definitely, there are pieces that I've loved because of that, that mark certain points in, the, yeah, in progress and in, in career. Well, I think as collectors too, um, we see that. And, and it's interesting that as, as we've collected over the years from various people and, and uh, collected at various stages of their their path as well. And, and um, it, to me, it makes the collection even that more, much more rich and exciting to share with people. And I think of our artwork is, you know, we I go around and look at it all the time instead of just hanging it up or putting it on a, a, a table or a pedestal. I take time to go visit my art and remember like what I, what the emotion was and what it, like that so I, I was going to say that as collectors you'd be surprised how much you know and especially if you see the collective pieces of the artists you can spot that piece that you go okay this artist accomplished something um stop doing your tracks oh yeah absolutely yes um yeah the other thing I think people should know, and, and again, we'll tell you where their studios are so you can maybe pop them after this, and we'll try to do a little Facebook um, visit as well. We'll go, when we end up here, we'll pause and then go live when we get to their spaces. But um, you both, you all have a lot of range of sizes. Um, even you, I believe I, you've got a few smaller pieces and then you're working on the, the more large pieces. Maybe by next year we'll have something in the courtyard. But um, I plan on it. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it, it's nice again as collectors or you know people learning about art that we can we can get in at different levels. And again, we started most of our early collection are smaller pieces, so we have a nice extensive collection of art. But we don't have gigantic pieces because we don't have gigantic walls. So it's really great that we have these artists that you can. You know, see a variety of sizes and, and price points. And um, we always encourage people to actually invest in original art because, you know, you can, 
then you can, uh, get a smaller piece and have an original piece of art that you'll have forever and you can really cherish. Yeah, and, and never be afraid to approach an artist, especially at this show, and say, hey, I love your work. You work really big. Let's talk and, you know, let's do something small. Because, I mean, I, there's, I did commission some really small pieces, and Aiden and I were talking about it yesterday and today. He's working on a real small one, and I walked on and said, oh, you brave man. Uh, small pieces are really hard. They take yeah, a the lot scale. of yeah. scale, and they, especially with figurative, and they take a lot of thought process to, to get them out and sure it's the same as sculpture. But, yeah, one of my favorite, oh, I see it around here too, but um, I've already talked to Luke Pye about it, becoming a member of the National Sculpture Society, which is a wonderful organization devoted to, to sculpture. And they have usually the annual event is um, a quick draw for sculptors. And it's all portrait sculpture. So it, um, like Paul Reiner's a member, but he doesn't participate in that because they're doing live uh, people. And they have, I, I, I don't remember, maybe it's four hours or something. It's not long enough. Is it four, you think, Todd? Yeah. So they all start, they have a live model in the middle and all the sculpture stands around and to see the concentration of, I think last time I was there, there was maybe 20. Um, yeah, the under 30, yeah. And so you watch these amazing, talented artists and they have their calipers and you know they'll run up and measure the face and go back. And um, it's the, the most use of calipers I've ever seen, but it's, it's, you know, it's pretty cool. And then you see an interpretation of, you know, one model, 20 different people and uh, it's judged, so the judges pick out the, the winner, and it's very exciting. So it's, we sometimes do that here, where we challenge a group of artists, you know, here's your subject matter, let's see how you each interpret that. In fact, um, we're going to we're gonna slide in another art discovery with uh, this group that they all painted butterflies, and it was a, something that you put down. Uh, four or five female artists, and all we is the same size they're all 20 by 20 and the only word used was butterfly and we have you know from realism to abstract and so it's going to be and we have not seen each other's work for the most part so it's going to be really interesting to see how we interpret that. so i forgot to schedule that in the regular schedule so it'll be an add-on facebook live for sure but um yeah again just the uh, ability to see through the eyes of an artist and especially in this 40,000 square feet of space where you can walk around and you know just just take in what their interpretation of the world and uh, we are so grateful to each of you for contributing to our panel today and hope it wasn't too bad on you guys the first time up well, and i will say that we're so grateful for our people like susan and jake who make this possible it doesn't exist anymore in a lot of places and the, it's not just that we get to interact with the collectors, it's how much I learn from these guys. And the fact that we create while we get to talk to you, it's, it's an incredible gift that is hard to find out. Yes, it's like a master's program in art, so um, yay. So um, if there's no other questions, I think we will, um, yes, so there, their studios are 237, booth 237. So he's over here on this on the outside aisle, 237. Okay, and cap space. 125. He's over there facing the courtyard. And I'm 244 across from the awesome. <laughs> yeah, so so these Priscilla and Aiden are, are not far away. They're like a, a, a road away from each other, an aisle. And uh Levi's over here. And um, yeah, take some time to look at their studios. And like I said, we'll, we'll throw a little uh, walkabout on Facebook um, or in the next you know, 10, 15 minutes. You can see us come back live at, at each of their studios. And uh, thank you for watching at home. And thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, next week is another awesome perspective.